Welcome into Revealing the Truth. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we are covering the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I am often moved by the people that we visit with, but I am never more moved than I am when someone who could be my family member, someone who has experienced firsthand what my family went through, someone who uh, survived the Holocaust with grace, dignity, under a power and a covering of the Lord. We're talking about Anita Dittman, who was just a little girl when the cold and foreboding winds of Hitler and Nazism began to blow through Germany. Abandoned by her father when he realized the price of being associated with a Jewish wife and family, Anita was raised by her mother came to believe that Jesus was her Messiah at eight years old. By the time she was 10, the war had begun. She has authored a book and a movie by the same name, working with Jan Markell, Trapped in Hitler's Hell. It is a true account of Holocaust horror, but also of God's miraculous mercy on a young girl who spent her teenage years desperately fighting for survival, yet learning to trust in the one she had come to love. Anita Dittman. It is more than a pleasure. It is more than an honor. This is a family reunion, and I welcome you to our program. Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to to be uh, in a company of like mind and background like I am, and uh, go ahead. Well, uh, I, I want to know your story. I want you to tell it. You know, the many times that you go before the school children and you tell them the story of yes. what it was like when yes. you were their age and what life was like in Germany. Uh, I want to know your story through your eyes and your own words, how you okay. came to faith in Jesus and what took place over the next 12 and a half years. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Let me clear my throat. This is Minnesota, and this is my morning frog. Yes. Um, well, I was born into a family setting of a Jewish mother and a Gentile father. However, my mother had kind of drifted away a little bit from the Lord and was interested in other things. And my father was a very proud atheist so there was no religion in the home whatsoever but mm. we were so comfortably wealthy that we didn't know what we were missing however interestingly enough the lord found me uh, we when my father left us at a certain point i was about two oh, five years old maybe hitler had just come to power and we lived in a beautiful environment, lovely suburb, everything. And when he left, there was not enough money, so we moved into a tiny little one-room apartment, my mother, my sister, and I, in a not-so-affluent neighborhood. But God needed me there, because that's where he would find me. And I had some new playmates, and pretty soon we learned to love each other and accept each other and their parents didn't mind that the kids play with a non-Aryan girl. Yes. Uh, so one day they asked me to go to church with them and I said, well, I don't know. I have to ask my mom. So I asked my mom and she said, yeah, go ahead. Well, it was very nice, very beautiful, and one day, it was right after I had given my first solo dance in front of a very large audience that was very successful, turned out great. My teacher was very, very happy that I did so well, but then I remember the day yet. And I was amazed, such a large audience, and they was overwhelming in their applause. Well, when it was do all done, I went backstage, and my teacher praised me, gave me a little gift. And that night, 
I slept with my ballet slippers and my new little baby doll under my pillow, and the baby doll on the pillow, and had wonderful dreams about the future, only to wake up the next morning. When my mother came in and she had found a newspaper and she said, well, let's see what they're saying about you, Anita, because her front page was totally devoted to that performance of these many different dance numbers. And they came to mind, they said, the dance was superbly performed by young Anita Dittman, far above her age. But the German people are no longer willing to be entertained by a Jew. And in addition, all money had run out because my father had left us, and I thought my world was coming to an end. Mm. Well, it was two months later when my friends invited me to an Easter service in their church, and their Christ came into my life. You know, it. I feel so blessed that you, as a rabbi, are letting me talk about Christ. Thank you. Well, I'm a, messi- I'm a Messianic rabbi. I believe like you do. Oh, nice. Wonderful. <laughs> I thought something was wrong here. Yeah. Oh, that's great because I have a friend up north who is a, a teacher, in, a Messianic teacher. Um, well, that moment when Christ came into my life, I felt a peace and a security I had never ever felt during all those plush first five years of my life when everything was affluent and wonderful. Well, needless to say, I ran home and I was (laughs) running, bursting into the apartment where my sister and my mother were and they said, well, what's the matter with you? And so I told them, and of course, they weren't ready to hear that. And my sister always looked down on her little, nitwit little sister that she had and and wrinkled her eyebrows. And I said, no, I said, it's real. It's not, it's not my imagination. Oh, yeah, yeah, we know your great imagination. So I talked to my friends the day after, and I broke down and cried. I said, what are we going to do with them? And they said, you let God do the doing. You just love them, be respectful to them, and let God do the rest of it. And I did. And ultimately, we had a minister of an inner city church come to us one day. He had heard about him when I was going to a parochial school, and uh, he visited us and gave each one of us a Bible. And it was after a few months that my mother accepted Christ in her life. And I tell you, it was such a joy for me, finally. And she said to me, Anita, I ask your forgiveness. I, she said, I was so stupid. You were so young, and you knew all about it, and you were telling us, and we didn't believe you. And I said, Mom, it's okay. God has a different timetable than we do, and I'm just so glad we have something in common now. My sister never came to it, but my mother and I had something to enjoy each other with. And ultimately, she became a Christ believer, and a wonderful one. But, uh, yes, life was tough. I, but my mother said, Anita, I remember when I fell apart and cried and that I lost my ballet, she said, you know, it's going to get a lot worse, so brace yourself and then pray. He said, God will help you through it. Yes, he did, through the worst. When this pastor that I'm talking about tried to get us out of the country, he had some connections in England, and only my sister's visa arrived, and when our visas were slowed down slightly, the war came and all the borders were closed, and no, uh, nobody was allowed out of the country, and nobody, no foreign male was allowed into the country. And with that, our hopes and dreams to go to England were no longer and a very 
bleak future stared at us. But my mother was, as I said, when she became a Christian, I mean, even before she was, she was always a very strong woman. And she said, Anita, you've got to be strong. You've got to ask the Lord to help you because things are going to be very tough for all of us. And I know already uh, some of my relatives were picked up in Berlin and sent to, like we called it, the ovens. And pretty soon it was at home, too. Uh, I was about 15 when, and I was just going to a um, public school, and the principal came into my schoolroom and he said, Didman, pack up all your things and meet me in the hallway. <coughs> and I came and I said, what did I do? The principal would come and get me out. He handed me an envelope, and when I opened it, it stated in bold print, due to your Jewish heritage, you are permanently suspended from school and not to be returning. And he added to it, and he said, well, it's about high time that the German government is cleansing our school system as on riffraff such as yourself. And two months later, I was drafted into very heavy forced labor, working in a, um, in a factory, carrying 100 pounds by myself many, many times a day. But God had helped me ahead of time. He always is ahead, was ahead of me. He gave me a very agile body, an athletic body, and in the German schools, Physical education was the number one thing because Hitler wanted a strong, healthy nation. And that helped me to develop strong muscles so that I could endure what lay ahead of me. And we, uh, my mother and I worked together on the same shift. But one morning on the 7th of January, 1944, when we were getting ready to go to the factory, there was a knock, familiar knock, at the front door of the apartment, and when we opened, two SS men marched in, grabbed my mother by the collar of her coat, set her down hard in the room that we occupied, my mother and I. <clears throat> and uh, in fact, I wanted to mention we lived in a surrounding, not so great, and not so great. Um, a, a, outside environment either, where four families shared one apartment, each family living in one room. But, you know, we were still glad that we hadn't been picked up yet. But what was this going on this morning, I thought. So they told my mother, you sit down and you read this, this statement there, this uh, application, and you fill it out. And then we'll explain to you. And so she did. And she had to write down that everything in that room was her uh, property. And uh, it said in there and that I was not to touch anything. They put red labels on everything except my bed and my personal belongings and my clothes. Everything else had a red label on. And I was told that the next day... The authorities would come and pick up all the red-labeled items and take them to the warehouse in the Gestapo headquarters and uh, that I would, if I wanted to, if I wanted them back, I had to pay for it. Nice, isn't it? <laughs> Can you imagine what that's like? That's absurd. Well, my mother, I found out that she was taken to Camp Theresienstadt However, I was going to say, my father, I called my father right away. I had gotten in touch with him. He had come back, and and he said, I will give you the money to buy the things back, but I will go to the head of the Gestapo, and I will talk to him. And he did. And lo and behold, the head of the Gestapo said, well, Mr. Dittman, um, if this is your furniture, my father told him, he said, you know, my wife and I were divorced, and... I let her have that furniture so she could live in a place with her with kids, and um, so he had the head of the Gestapo who knew my dad from before, and uh, he uh, 
let me keep my furniture. So, ah, uh, that was good. <laughs> but more, more provision from is, God. Yes, you bet. And not only that, the connection between God, my mother, and me was so fantastic. And I will. I don't know how much time I've got to talk, but it, I've got to tell you about it because it's a miracle too. Because I made up my mind. I knew they were allowed to f get packages now and then, all right, and which was very unusual. Excuse me, my nose is running. But um, so I said, I talked to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm strong, strong, and I'm healthy, and I can work. So please keep me well because I am going to have to use my rations that only feed me and share it with my mother. I didn't think I was doing something great. She had made so many sacrifices on my account. It was time for me to reciprocate. And it worked great. And one day, I always sent her, among other things, the dark German hybrid, which is so durable and, in fact, so, for, so firm, you can sit on it without making a dent into it. But it, uh, and she would then write back to me a little card that she was allowed to send. And, <clears throat> and then w one morning I got up and I said, I'm not going to send her this dark bread. I sent her Swiebuck. And she told me then, she said, you received the Swiebuck. And she said, Anita, it was just amazing because she said, I knelt down by my cot at night and prayed to God to, for you to send me Swiebuck because she was stricken with dysentery and couldn't eat the dark bread. I said, wow, what a hard line to heaven. And this went about everything. I mean, God always came to my rescue. Oh, yeah, he tested me for a little while. How strong is your faith, Anita? And, yes, my faith was strong. But the Lord, of course, gave me that strong faith. I needed it badly. Okay, go ahead. I'll be quiet. I'll do no, 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 no. So you actually were in forced labor, but you were living in an apartment, not in a camp? Right, but that comes later. One day I came home about, oh, seven months or so after they picked up my mother. But they informed me, and I had enough time to write to my mother that I won't be able to send her food anymore. And I had to be very careful because everything was censored. So I, uh, I said, God, how am I going to let her know? I had until the next morning where I had to stand in line at the main railroad station and <clears throat> with a knapsack, my meager belongings. Anyway, I had, so God inspired me, and I went to the bake shop. I picked up one of those breads that, was, that I was talking about, the nice dark ribers, and had a label, company label on one side, on one end, and I trimmed it off carefully, and then I had a, a, a round-handled knife, that I used to make a long, deep indentation, and I inserted a, a message in there, and then sealed everything, put this uh, label on again, and then I asked one of my Aryan friends uh, to come over, and could she pick up the bread and mail it for me, because I couldn't the next day, so she did. And it was so awesome, because I prayed over that loaf of bread that the Nazis wouldn't steal it out of the package because it was a known factor that they would help themselves to the content on many of these packages. They were well, well fed, it just mean it. And lo and behold, 11 months later, I found out that this time the loaf of bread was covered every inch of it with a thick layer of fluffy green mold but my mother was so hungry she scraped all that mold off and the bread was edible and i said lord thank you <laughs> you've done it again <laughs> and um i tell you i could fill two hours alone just to tell about the miracles that the lord performed but we don't have that much time sure we so do go ahead we have all kinds of time good we have all kinds of time 
So Good. it was, uh, it's now, what, 1933, 1934? No, no, it was um, uh, No, I'm sorry, 1940. For 1944. 1944, and you finally got uh, relocated to uh, Theron Seinstadt. It in, was... In Czechoslovakia. No, no. No. Uh, oh, my mother. Oh, your yeah. mother. That's oh, that's where your mother was. She was in Czechoslovakia. Yeah, my mother was in Camp Trezinšat, and I went to a camp. Uh, the day after I'd sent that bread off, I went to a camp called Bartholt. It was a camp specially made for people who had a mixed family background, and um, and we were subjected to extremely hard labor. Uh, we were housed in a filthy old cow barn. The women were, the men were housed in a uh, horse stable out in the fields, but at least we were outside in the in the country, which I love so much. But anyhow, we were awakened, about 150 women in one cow barn that had never been cleaned out, but just a fresh straw on it, a toilet facility with a ditch, and our washing facility for 150 women was a faucet on the outside of the barn and so on. And we were awakened at four in the morning, given a something kind of an in, in, uh, imitation coffee and a piece of bread. And then they loaded us up with digging equipment. And we carried this with us, and we marched and marched and marched, and finally we came to a huge open farm field. And the farmers had to give to the Nazis some of the land for us to be digging ditches, ditches that were about, let's see, I'm about almost five feet, probably about eight feet deep at least, and about ten 15 feet wide, and then I don't know how many kilometers long. We were all together, <coughs> 300 men and women, and we started digging. We dug about, I would say, 10 hours a day, and then we marched home, and we stood in line for our measly, watery uh, grub, whatever was swimming around, and we never knew. And we had our evening meal, and then we uh, were allowed to wash ourselves. They had little enamel pans, and we would wash ourselves, and then we took, they handed it down to the other person to, fill, to be refilled with water. And so it went day after day until winter came, and then the ditches had been dug, and then we were working outside 10 hours a day in snow or rain or whatever and uh, working in the f in the forest cutting down pine trees and uh, then we cut off the branches and uh, wired them around as a padding for the ditches that we had dug well anyway to make a long story short it's amazing. Nobody froze to death. We um, <coughs> when we got back, got home, we no longer lived in the barns. We lived in some crummy old old dance hall. But at least it was a little bit above. The end. But we went to the outhouses, and we the food got worse. The work was harder. More and more people came by transport into the camp. But it's amazing. Nobody died. The food got more scant. And pretty soon, because of the lack of sanitation, we contracted head lice from one another. <laughs> and so it went every day. But we... I had lost a lot of weight because the food was so horrible and I had hepatitis just shortly before I went to camp. And so they sent me to sick bay. 
and that whenever they send somebody to sick bay, probably they rarely ever returned. Right. <clears throat> but I did return, and it was a miracle, because what they did is they gave me a little tiny orange pill, and they said I should swallow that, and then I would feel better, but I didn't. I vomited. I threw up all the dark junk that they had fed me. But another girl who was in the camp with me was sleeping in another bed, and she had some other problem. And she said, you know what? I get potatoes, and I I will share those with you. So the minute the nurse gives you that pill, push it under your, in your cheek. And then she says, drink the stuff that she gives you, and then go down to the outhouse as soon as the nurse has left and make vomiting noises and throw that stuff down into the into the outhouse. And it worked. And I ate her, some of her potatoes and I started to gain weight. And of course, when they saw that I was gaining weight, they sent me back to the hard labor and her too. And uh, we worked and we worked, but at least I didn't get killed. I think I'm a tough old Ross. I'm almost 90. You, s so you certainly <laughs> are. You know what's fascinating about your story to me, Anita, is this. That here you were, uh, an Aryan father, a Jewish mother, your mother and you came to faith. Because yes. you came from a mixed background, they sent you to Barthold, as opposed to where Mengele was taking young women like yourself and experimenting on them. And they yes. were looking for... Uh, and and it's, it's amazing how God works that you would be born into a mixed family because yeah. that disqualified you from the experimentation on trying to yeah. figure out uh, what made pure, pure Jewish people operate, whether or not their organs were different, whether or not their, their uh, reproductive systems were different. They had such a skewed uh, agenda in experimentation. Oh, I know. Yeah. See, we were just a little bit more Aryan than the others, and that's why we were sent to these camps. But I tell you, the <coughs> the uh, we were told around short before Christmas, we were told that as soon as our work was completed, you see the, the um, ditches were for traps for the Russian tanks. As soon as that was completed, they'd be sent, we were sent to Auschwitz. Ah. Yeah, but the Russians got there first. Yes. And pretty soon the Russians came so close to us. We were still doing hard labor, ridiculously hard labor, but hard labor, they made sure. And my shoes had worn out, and they gave me a pair of shoes with a wooden sole and very rough tops. And pretty soon I rubbed the blister on my heel and it became infected and uh, I felt feverish, but I couldn't let anybody know except my closest friend. She, I could tell her, and so sometimes I would lean on her because you see the, the uh, mentality of the Nazis was if you have signs of sickness, then ultimately you won't be used to us and right. so we either club you to death or we torture you to death. So I didn't tell anybody, and I prayed that the Lord will help me not to limp. But pretty soon I felt feverish, the lymph glands swelled in my leg, and I, but I had to be quiet, and my friend never said a word either. Well, one night we felt funny, it was strange, but we heard noise in the distance, and uh, the uh, the evening sky would be lit up bright red at the horizon and there was vibration beneath us and it smelled like fire. Well, when we were coming home that one night and I was li not limping, I tell you, I, my mother taught me never to give in to pain and I'm glad she taught me. And so we got into our quarters and we got nothing to eat, but that's okay. 
and we didn't care. And we were locked up. The men were locked up in their quarters, and we women were locked up. We couldn't, that nobody could escape. And there were five of us girls. We got extremely strong in our bond for each other through Christ. And we prayed that night, and we said, Lord, if it is your will that we should live, then help us, free us from our persecutors. Well, I tell you, God's, we didn't tell him what to do because we knew he's a, be, a better man to, to figure it out. And it was a fantastic dream. I mean, a, a fantastic uh, plan that he had. The next morning, <coughs> we all the women were uh, asked to climb on horse-drawn carts or uh, wagons that were chauffeured by um, Polish prisoners of war who worked as slaves on, on German farms. And we were separated from the men, of course, and one of my friends had a husband in there, and it was just, she just fell apart. But anyway, I'm glad that I didn't have to walk because I really could not, not right. walk anymore. Right. Well, we saw a um, railroad station on the way where they were going to take us, and it was kind of still slightly dark in the morning, and as we got closer and closer, we came to what we knew would be a crematory because it had um, it was a big complex of barracks with barbed wire fence around it. It was electrically loaded. And in the middle of the complex was a big, huge contraption that went way up to, toward heaven. And we knew that that would be no, the oven. Well, that morning, the Lord performed the miracle of miracles. Two of the girls, no, three of the girls, the five of us, they escaped the moment that the uh, the uh, guards contemplated on what to do because we couldn't get into the barracks. We needed keys and we needed lamps and everything. So because this whole complex was owned by a manufacturing company. And he needed volunteers. And so my girlfriend and I, we volunteered to go there. And so he gave the um, guard, I mean the um, chauffeur, I uh, kind of an order to what to bring. Well, that moment, my girlfriend and I hopped on that wagon, and he whipped the horses, and we just <laughs> literally <laughs> bounced around on that cart and came to the railroad station, and we asked him to stop there. And he stopped me. Oh, yeah, we gave him some cigarettes that we had saved from something that we had brought from home. I was not a smoker, but I saved the cigarettes, and so did she. And then we gave him some money that my mother had left for me uh, in case I had to buy the furniture back. And so I, and he whipped the horse even faster, got into the railroad station, let us off, and took off. And my girlfriend and I prayed for him that he would not be caught in any way and be punished. And there, when we came to the railroad station, there was a, <coughs> a long train of um, cattle cars, and then there were flatbeds. And on the flatbeds were tanks, big, huge army tanks. And there was a very handsome German soldier standing there, and I looked the most Aryan because I had blonde hair from my father's side of the family, and they said, why don't you go over and ask him? And I went, and he smiled, big smile, and he said, but can I help you, little girl? And I said, well, maybe. I said, what are these for, these tanks? Oh, they are demolished Russian tanks that we got from the Russian battlefront, and we are taking them to near Berlin and Furstenwalde, and there, of the, <coughs> excuse me, I have to take a sip of water. Take your time. And there, um, they would be repaired for our use. 
then what can you do? What can I do for you? Well, can we ride those with you to Furstenwalde? And of course, we we didn't have to lie because it was true that we were afraid of the Russians because I was told by the farmers, we were told by the farmers that the Russians would be at our doorstep. And this was the moment, was the more <coughs> was the time that that would happen. And here we were on that railroad station and we were hoping that we could go with him. And sure enough, he lifted us five girls into the tank. And then uh, when we were comfortable enough, he <coughs> sat down b between us, and we were really packed, sti packed tightly. And then another soldier looked in and uh, told the, this guy that his name was Valdemar, uh, told him, he said, here are some sandwiches and some hot tea for you and the girls, so you have to... <coughs> you have to, you know, share it with them. Right. And the uh, CO had consented that we would take the, the, that he could take the girls. And pretty soon the whistle blew and off we went. And it was <coughs> snowing and there were holes in the top of that tank and we, the soldiers took off their waterproof uniforms that they had on top of their uniform and off we went. And pretty soon, it was getting dark outside, and we kept on going. And I was, we were all getting tired, but we were so afraid to fall asleep for fear that in our, in our sleep that we could possibly talk and let the soldier know who we are. Who's right. And so we both all silently prayed, and I fell asleep on the shoulder of this nice guy. <coughs> and in the middle of the night, I woke up with my legs, my legs so ice cold that I had almost no feeling in it. And he rubbed my feet and my legs, and then he said, put your leg between my thighs, and I'm going to keep you warm. And you know... I was so awed by the decency of this young man. He never touched me anywhere where he shouldn't. He never kissed me. He was kind, he was caring, keeping me warm. And on we went. And finally we came to Fürstenwalde in uh, mid-morning, and there we had to say goodbye to them too. And he gave me his army address and he said, write to me. Well, we went on. <laughs> and uh, found refuge finally in Bautzen, Saxony, of the province of Saxony, and we found refuge in the home of the in-laws of my, one of my girls that escaped with us. And there we stayed. Oh, I was, I was there about a day and a half, and my fever rose to 105. And my legs swelled more, and I knew it was an infection. So they, the yeah, the <coughs> the two girls, two went someplace, and then uh, two went to another one. The other <coughs> two, two, we went together, stayed together, three of us. And so they hauled me to in a kitty car to the nearest hospital. And all hospitals, of course, were governed by the Nazis. Right. And a nurse came and greeted us with a Heil Hitler, and she wore the party pin, so you knew she was a super Nazi. And she said, oh, my goodness, because the blonde hair <laughs> was my protection. Right. And she said, you have an infection, and you have to stay in the hospital. And I'll you stay here? And then she came back. And my friends had to leave and go back to where we were staying, had been staying. And she was very nice to me. She cut off my knee highs. And then she said, I have to tell you, though, I may not be able to get a doctor right away because we are terribly understaffed and over-occupied. So many people from different places were there bombings that were wounded. So I don't know if I can find a room for you, but I'll find a bed for you. So she gave me those wonderful, fashionable hospital gowns, and 
and uh, I climbed into a bed, in a, and I had a hard time going to sleep because I wasn't used to sleeping in a bed anymore. <laughs> it was so, but nevertheless, I woke up the next morning, and after about a week or so, <laughs> A doctor came, a lady doctor, and she was very kind to me, and she said, Anita, we have to operate right away. We don't have antibiotics, but you have uh, blood poisoning, and we will wrap your leg in some disinfectant solution, and then the next day, we're going to drill holes in your foot, right foot and put tubes in and put some stuff or some ointment on it that's supposed to draw the infection out. <laughs> well, when I woke up from the anesthesia and that nurse that, the Nazi nurse had given me the anesthesia, I was shocked because I heard her say to the doctor, my, my, did that little girl ever talk, talk a lot? And I remember then one of my mother's sisters that lived with us in the apartment there where we all lived together, she told me once that of all this uh, <coughs> and the Caesar told on <coughs> that of all the anesthesias, ether was the strongest, and sometimes people talk from their subconsciousness, and I found out right away that I must have been what I did because she treated me with such hostility and she would look and whatever the doctor ordered to prevent the infection getting worse she would counteract and I got worse and pretty soon I had a big lump in my thigh and the doctor came and he said you have another lump above the knee we had to operate again they already operated <coughs> on my foot twice, so this was the third surgery. And uh, she said, the, the doctor said, I will do all I can to get you well so you can be on your way. <coughs> I knew right away she was not a Nazi, but she had to be careful because if she was too nice to me, this nurse could have reported her to the right. Gestapo and you know where she, she would go but the nurse worked feverishly to get dirt into my open wounds and I felt worse and worse and sure enough <coughs> that lump in my thigh the one I by the way almost by the groin um, and the inside of my thigh and the other lump were getting bigger and the, the doctor came and she said to me, Anita, tomorrow we have another surgery, your third surgery. And <coughs> I want to tell you, it's going to be a very dangerous surgery because we are digging a tunnel from one lump to the other. And we're having big, deep cuts to get the, that lump out. And if we find that we can't serve, save your leg, we have to cut it off right by the hip. Mm. And boy, I spent a pretty restless night, you can imagine. And I prayed, I said, Lord, help me. Please help me. Because how can I live on one leg and outrun the Nazis or maybe the Russians? Well, the Lord intervened again, and I woke up after that surgery, and I was in terrible pain. They cut a real big cut on the upper what, leg, on the upper thigh, and then up above the knee, and then they dug a passage from one to the other, and they didn't have to cut off the leg. And it was I glad. I, t I, I sent a lot of thank you notes to the Lord. Yes. The nurse was not very happy because she wanted to win that trophy from Hitler for killing a Jew. You see, there was a, a medal for every Jew that would, every Nazi that would kill a Jew. <coughs> so, well, uh, it, 
didn't heal very well. I had, they had to go in again and see what was wrong. And of course, more pus had developed because that nurse used the open wounds and permitted unsanitary conditions. Well, they cleaned things out and cleaned out the tunnel that they had dug. And my girlfriend came to see me all the time. And when she, and at one thing was interested, when she came to see me, she said, open up your bandage, I want to see. She said, you know, when things got worse, I went to the doctor by night, I didn't want to tell you. But I told her about this and she said, you know, it's funny because she said, the nurse has been telling me that your friend is uh, recuperating nicely. Yeah, she said, I can imagine. And then uh, the doctor said, well, I'm, I can't do no any more on nothing, but all I could do is send the nurse someplace else in a hospital where she would have more prestige and where she would get better pay. And it worked. Well, interestingly enough, in the meantime, I had gotten, I had written a letter to that nice German soldier and I thanked him and I finally told him what cargo he, they had been taking. Mm. And he said, it doesn't matter to me. I just am glad I could help you. And please, I hope you can get well. I would like to come and visit you. And I said, I would like that very much, so come. And he didn't come though. Either they sent him to the battlefront, back to the battlefront or else something. And I, I thought then it's glad he didn't come because if that nurse had, would have seen me have a visitor with a <laughs> German uniform on, she would have reported both of us to the Gestapo and we would be killed because that is race disgrace, you see. So God kept him from it. But my girlfriend looked at my wounds and she said, Anita, why did God permit that? I said, there's a reason. I just don't understand him. You've been faithful to him. I said, Hera, don't question God. There is a reason. He never does anything to hurt us. Who knows, I said to her, without knowing what lay ahead. Who knows? Maybe these wounds were going to be by protection someday. Well, she didn't question anymore. She came to visit me, and one day the Russians had come in and paid us a visit. And the whole hospital was in uproar, and people were being raped right and left. And when they came for me, two Russian soldiers pulled me off my cot, took me to a place in the air raid shelter where we all had been camping for uh, over a week and threw me on a mattress, ripped off my clothes. And when they saw this blood-stained uh, bandage, they thought I was faking. So they called a student nurse over. And they wanted her to unwrap the bandage. And lo and behold, when the last bit of the bandage came off, they saw the pus really squirting out of those those uh, wounds, and I grossed them out so badly they took off and looked for a better, more appetizing uh, subject. Romans eight and, and twenty. Here it was. <coughs> here it was, and how did I know? Yes. When I said maybe these wounds will be my protection, they were. God must have put that into my mind. Yes. And when Hela came back, I told her about it, and she said, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. I said, yeah, I can, because he he, know, he loves me, and he, he's trying to spare my leg. And since his nurse was gone, I had a chance to recuperate and in the air raid shelter for a while, and then I went, and here's another interesting thing. 
a little child that died in the air raid shelter, and we surrounded the mother with our prayers, laying hands on her. And she had a infection in the lungs, and we tried to comfort her and prayed with her. And all of a sudden, I was standing closest to the exit of the, the air raid shelter, and I heard footsteps coming from first floor. And I thought, oh, what if those are Russians? And I climbed, I couldn't walk well yet, so I climbed on my hands and knees up those rickety, uh, dilapidated concrete steps. And when I came to the first landing, sure enough, there was a group of Russian soldiers led by a commander. And I said, and I didn't speak Russian. I said, no, no, no. I said, baby, dying, mother, crying, people praying, and then he must have understood some German, because all of a sudden he gave it a command to the soldiers, and they all left. Again, God's hand. I was so grateful, because they could have picked me up and taken me along and abused me. So, anyway, well, there was a moment of fighting that stopped. The Germans, I said, had temporarily pushed the uh, Russians out of the city. And I ventured out to the outer hall. And when I came, it was hardly any light out there. I saw in the dim light of my candle a woman sitting on a mattress, weeping profusely. And when I came closer, I saw it was that very nurse who tried to kill me. Well, I argued with God. I said, I know you want me to comfort her, but please, I can't. I can't. I, she tried to kill me, you know. <laughs> Dumb, broad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Me, you know. <laughs> of course, he knew that. God already knew that. And I said, Lord, if you could put into my heart, take out the, the bitterness, and put into my heart the love you had for the people when they nailed you to the cross. And when you prayed and said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And let me have that kind of attitude, please. And then I will go and I will comfort her. And he did. And I kind of half crawled because my leg was still pretty sore. And when I came to her mattress, she was still sobbing, and I sat down, I put my arm around her, and she saw who I was because I had a candle in my hand. I put the candle on the table there, and she, she clung to me and wept and wept and wept, I, and I said, what happened? And between sobs, she said, I've been raped many times. And I wept with her because I was so exceedingly inwardly thankful to God that he had spared me. And I prayed with her. And all of a sudden, she pushed herself away from me. She said, how could you comfort me? Didn't you realize I tried to kill you? I said, yes, I know. Then how can you comfort me? I said, with God's help and for God's sake. And... Um, then she finally stopped, and I was now an ambulatory patient, and so then they shipped me to another place, different hospital, and there I stayed for about 24 hours, and they pulled the tubes out of my wounds, they put new bandage on, gave me, and I could not walk alone. I had to have a crutch or a cane, and somebody brought those to me, and so they took away the uh, crutch they and the and the and the uh, cane. They got new bandage on. They gave me some bandage to take along, and they said, "Anita, tomorrow morning you have to go home." I said, "I have no home." They said, "There are lots of people that don't have a home. You just have to have to see what you can do." But we need your bed, and we need your crutch, and we need your cane. I said, "I can't walk without them." Well, you just have to manage to do it anyway. So the next morning came and I stood under a beautiful uh, blue sky and sunshine and it was about, I had been in the hospital for about eight weeks and 
I stood out there and I said, Lord, I can't walk without a cane. I can't walk without a crutch. Hang on to me, please, and walk with me. And he steadied me. And I know it sounds like it's a fairy tale, but it wasn't. God can do supernatural things. And he walked with me, and I... And then finally, after so long, we, I came to a little town in the mountains in, in the Sudetenland, and there I went to a hospital, a Catholic hospital, and the nuns were so kind to me. And I didn't say who I was, and they didn't ask. They got me better. And I, then I met a girl in a ward where I was who had a broken leg, and she got to be my friend. And I knew I had to have a passport to go through Czechoslovakia, and she had to have a, a visa or something to go back to her own home. And we kind of got together, and one of the police officers found a little um, <coughs> attic someplace, and we both moved in there. And the Lord took really care of us. And the one police officer <coughs> told me, come today, and I'll get a passport for you so you can tra travel into Czechoslovakia. And he said to me, but why would a cute girl like you believe it? I was cute one time, but anyhow gone. And um, he said, why would you want to travel to Czechoslovakia all by yourself? You should have an escort. Oh, sir, I said, I have an escort. He brought me here. <coughs> Who? Jesus. And he raised his eyebrows. And he made out a passport in three languages. And I paid him by my last penny, believe me whatever little money I'd saved up in that little coin purse that my mother had left behind. And he said, you may have to hitchhike. And I said, I know. But he said, I wish you God's blessings. And he let me go. And I did hitchhike. And he, oh, he said to me, you know, he said, uh, don't talk. Just don't let people know you are Czech. You are not Czechoslovakian because the Czechs hate the Germans. Right. <coughs> with a passion because the Germans had been so horrible to them. So pretend to be a deaf mute. <laughs> mm. And my friends who know me well, they said, boy, for you to be pretending to be deaf mute, that <laughs> take another miracle from God. Anita, but, um, Anita this has been yeah. an absolute joy. I wanted you to tell your story without interruption, but unfortunately, we've truly run out of time. Oh, that's okay. But I want my audience to know that this is Anita Dittman, author of Trapped in Hitler's Hell, A Young Jewish Girl Discovers the Messiah's Faithfulness in the Midst of the Holocaust. This story will pierce your heart as you take this journey with Anita, who grabbed hold of the Talit of the Messiah and it carried her through what could have been the worst conditions of her life and bring about her death. But God sustained her for the reason that she might share her testimony, to bring Jewish people to faith in the power of God who was right there with her in these work camps, sustained her, comforted her, healed her, and brought her to the United States. And while she was here, she has spoken to thousands upon thousands of people her story has been made into a movie called Trapped in Hitler's Hell. I encourage you to read her book, get to know her. She is a national treasure. Anita Dittman, I love you. And also pray for Jan Markell because she has a ministry of her own. Yes, and Olive Tree Ministries, Jan Markell, a good yes. friend and someone we believe in so strongly. Anita well, Dittman, thank she, you so she, much. She said she is the one that wrote the book. I yes. gave her every detail, but yes. she's the one, she's the writer. Yes. God bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Thank you. B'shem Yeshua, Mishikano, in the name of Yeshua. Amen. We love you, Anita. And Thank you so much. And shalom to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.